All right, and we're recording. So, James, thanks so much for taking the time. It's a pleasure to, to meet you and speak to you. It's great to be here, Jake. I appreciate you re uh, reaching out and inviting me. And first question, is that a virtual background or are you in a No, nope, this is my office. No, I, I, it looks like a forest. No, this is um, my, one of my offices this is my Rockland County office, which is just outside of Manhattan. And the plants actually have a very funny quick story about them. And that is I never was a plant guy. I never had a green thumb. And when my mom passed away about eight years ago after a long battle with cancer, she had been a plant person her whole life. Mm. And so her house was just filled with plants. Mm. And so I decided, you know, when she passed away, I would didn't want the plants to die. I felt like she'd taken care of them for many years. So I took one of her plants. It's actually this plant that's right here next to me. What I didn't realize is that this kind of plant has these little offshoots that grow and, and they, they're like babies. And if you put them in the dirt, they turn into a whole nother plant. So oh. most of the plants in this office are actually the baby plants from the original plant that was my mom. So I now have, I don't even know, 50 of these plants that are really just offshoots of my, so I jokingly say that it's like not only like little shop of horrors, yeah. but there's sort of a little piece of my mom all over the place here in, in the oh office and, and it's given me kind of a green thumb, so I like it. Wow, that's, inc that's incredible, that's beautiful. But if you know anybody who needs some plants, I got a lot of plants, because mm. every time they have a baby, I feel like, well, I can't just throw it out, so I have to put it in another pot, and now I, I think I'm single-handedly keeping one of the gardening stores in this town in business. So wow. I think there's going to be no more room for people in my office. Wow. Well, that, that's a beautiful story. That, that's really interesting. And i really curious, James, to talk about your work and your philosophies. But I want to start by asking about yourself. So how does a, how does a divorce lawyer become, you know, internet famous and how did you how did you build an internet personality and, and how did that happen like i don't i don't know a lot of attorneys who have uh an, yeah in presence yeah yeah that it's a great question and and i don't think it's one i've been asked before so i i was i think all trial lawyers are secretly performers right like hmm. we're all kind of closet entertainers or hacks because hmm. we, you know trial law is i like to describe it as full contact storytelling that it really is just sort of an opportunity to tell a story and you're trying to tell a story better than the other lawyer. And it's an interesting way to tell a story because you're trying to tell a story while someone else is trying to stop you from telling the story and tell a different story at the same time. So it's like even more challenging than just storytelling because it's like storytelling while someone's trying to punch holes in your story. And so I think we all are naturally performers, trial lawyers. And I, um, I actually, you know, in 2018, I heard a podcast interview with Stephen King, the author, and he, they were talking about how he had written, like he writes like two, three books a year for now going on 40 years or something. And they said, you know, how do you do that? How are you so prolific as a writer? And he said, and it was a simple truth, but it, it really stuck with me. He said, you know, if you write a page a day in a year, you have a book. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? So I thought I'd give it a try. And I get up at 4 a.m. every day. I just naturally do. So every morning, I would just try to write a page. And some days, it would take me a half an hour. And some days, I could knock out 10 pages in a half an hour. And within a year, I had a book. And the book, thankfully, was, was published. It was very well received. Um, New York Times wrote a nice review of it. And it did well. And that opened a lot of doors for me in terms of, of doing um, television promotions of the book. So I ended up doing the Steve Harvey show, Rachel Ray, you know, a lot of radio, uh, a lot of podcasts. And, and I think when you show up and you're interested and interesting, um, you get invited back. And so I ended up doing 13 episodes of Steve Harvey. I ended up, you know, uh, and what happens, I think, even in Hollywood and, 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 and in, in any of these kinds of industries is if you show up on time, you're nice to everybody, you're courteous to every production assistant, to every person who walks you through the parking lot, which I was always raised to just behave that way towards people. And, um, you know, I think people just go, oh, that, that guy Jim was really nice. Let's have him back. So I ended up becoming the correspondent for Access Hollywood on, on legal cases, primarily divorce-related cases. And then that put my name out there. And I think the thing that caused this latest sort of blow-up of it, because it's been from 2018 until, you know, 
about a year, not even a year ago, six months ago. It was steady in terms of I did Access Hollywood a couple times a month. I would do TV shows here and there. And I got, and I would do podcasts, you know, be invited on podcasts fairly often. And the books did steadily well. But Mark Liotta from Soft White Underbelly reached out to me. And I was a fan of Soft White. You know, my policy has always been including this conversation I'm having with you. I don't appear on shows that I don't listen to or enjoy myself. Like if I enjoy the show myself, then I'll appear on it, you know. But if somebody calls me and says, hey, do you want to be on this podcast that, you know, it's just not a topic I'd be interested in. It's not a host I, I would be interested in. I've been invited to, and I, I won't be discourteous and name names, but I've been invited to be on some big platforms. And I've been like, yeah, that's not a person I'm really interested in working with. It's not a person who I think I'd have an interesting conversation with. And it's not like a better than, it's just, I don't think I can do a good appearance with somebody I don't have rapport with and who, you know, cause I think it's, this is a dance a little bit. It's you and me, you know? Yeah. And so um, Mark and I did, you know, an hour interview on Soft White Underbelly. And the way Mark does things is he just shoots. Like you just kind of forget, you know, like we are now. Like you just think you're, you know, you're just having a conversation. Yeah. And um, when we finished it, he said, well, that was amazing. And I said, oh, cool. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Like it was fun talking to you. And he texted me the next day and he said, I just need to tell you I've done thousands of interviews that was one of the best ones I've ever done. And I think this thing's going to get like 4 million views. And I thought, well, he, I bet he says that to everybody. Like, that's a nice, you know, a nice thing to say. It's like saying, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen to a woman. It's like, maybe, maybe it's true. Maybe it's not, but it's nice. You say it. And uh, I went, oh, that's great, man. You know, I really hope so. And meanwhile, I thought nobody's going to be that interested in this. Like I'm, you know, I'm a divorce lawyer. Like it's, I didn't say anything so groundbreaking. Like I just kind of, I didn't plan anything. I didn't think about it. I just said what I said. And sure enough, it got released. And within, a, I think within two days, it had a million and a half views. And then it had 2 million and 3 million. And now it's at like 3.4, 3.5. And it caught the attention of some bigger people. And that caught the attention of Lex Friedman, Andrew Huberman, you know, some of the, the bigger people. And uh, I was invited to, to go out to, uh, to, to um, Austin, Texas to do Lex Friedman's show. And that's done very well. That, that has, you know, a couple million views now on YouTube and it's been downloaded. You know, and Lex is, again, some, the, I'm a fan of these things. So I'm a fan of Software Underbelly. I'm a fan of Lex Friedman's podcast. I'm a yeah. fan of Andrew Huberman and Huberman Labs. So, um, you know, that's kind of what's happened with it. But what's funny is, um, you know, I have a full-time job and I don't just mean a full-time job. I have a demanding full-time job. Like being a divorce trial lawyer in New York city is a, it's a two days, two people's worth of a full-time job. It's 14 to 17 hour days, uh, six, oh. seven days a week. It's the reason I'm divorced is because it's that much, you know, it's just a harsh mistress being a divorce lawyer. And uh, so, so finding the time to do it all has been challenging, but it's very surreal, very cool. I cannot stand still anywhere in New York City now that someone doesn't come up to me, especially if I'm wearing what I was wearing on, on any of these appearances, which, you know, is generally what I'm wearing. I'm usually wearing, you know, a shirt and tie um, because I'm usually coming from work. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. I'll be waiting for a drink at Starbucks, you know, waiting for it to finish and someone will come up and go, hey, are you that? And I go, yes, I am. And then they'll proceed to tell me their life story and about their own divorce or their own relationship. Um, but I, I enjoy it very much. I, 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 I'm I very much enjoying. Um, it's not the attention. You know, I think that that um, I always I always was a fan of the idea that being famous was an unfortunate side effect of being talented and not the goal. Like the goal was the praise of strangers. Like that seems weird to me. Like having strangers love you doesn't, it seems kind of odd to me. But I will say it's incredibly, I get, you know, dozens of messages a day from people, emails, private, you know, uh, uh, Instagram messages, all just saying, man, I loved your interview. Or, man, I loved you, you on this podcast. And, and it's done something for the way I look at relationships or it's helping me heal in some way or it's helping me just feel, you know, like feel better about what I went through in a divorce or how I can focus on the next chapter of my life. And, um, and that's the most gratifying thing in the world. That's just an incredibly 
beautiful, wonderful thing to experience um, at this chapter in my life after 20 plus years of facilitating the demise of unhappy relationships. So it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice side side road, but I'm still on the main highway of being a, a divorce trial lawyer. So it's, it's, I haven't given up my day job. Is he? That's incredible. A couple of things you said really stood out to me that were earlier and you mentioned uh, that you're on these interviews, you're both interested and interesting. I think a lot of people really strive to be interesting. You know, they think that it's it's really mm -hmm. important to display themselves as interesting, mm -hmm. to have accomplishments and to demonstrate those. And I think not as many people realize that being interested is even more important, is even yeah. and that's yeah. what and that's what you said is you demonstrated both, right? You know, I said I used to, I first said that that phrase that you should be interested and interesting. I thought when I had my sons when my sons were teenagers. I because I remember when they were first like interested in romantic relationships and bo both my sons are heterosexual. So both my sons were interested in girls and they were saying to me, um, you know, like, yeah, you know, like, what do, what do like, they were like, Oh, I like this girl. And I used to always say, well, you know, you want to be interesting and you want to be interested. And those are two different things, but they're really both important in, not just interactions with the with with your you know potential romantic partner, opposite sex, same sex, or whatever it might be, but but the idea that that like not only do you want to have something that you bring to the table in terms of 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 what's compelling about you, but also to acknowledge that this other person is compelling. You know, I've always I always uh, thought one of the most sincere compliments I could say to a woman as a, as a heterosexual man. You know, because you say to a woman, oh, you're very beautiful, you know, well, a beautiful woman's probably been told she's beautiful a billion times, you know. But to say, you know, well, you're very compelling, you know, that's a real compliment. Like when someone's compelling, you know, like, and, and, and that's not necessarily even a romantic thing. Like, like the first time I talked to Andrew Huberman, Andrew Huberman is compelling. Like this is a compelling person. This is a person who has just a huge amount of knowledge, a point of view on so many things. He's been and done and seen so much. He knows so many interesting people and he's not the slightest bit interested in name dropping. He's just legit talk. It's like Lex, like you're talking to Lex and, and he's, you know, like, oh yeah, well, you know, the other day Elon and I were blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, he's talking about Elon Musk. Like, like, but he's talking about it. Like I'm talking about my friend, Steve, you know, like, oh yeah, Elon and I were eating sushi the other day. And you're like, dude, like you're talking about Elon Musk right now. So it, it's a really, um, I think it's a cool thing for people to to learn to, that, that, that the exchange, you know, between people is, is what's magical, you know, is that interested yeah. and interesting. Yeah, and, and, and caring and like, and being in, in not just, not just displaying, but also wanting to, uh, wanting to know more about them. So how did you, how did you decide to become a divorce lawyer? Yeah, I, um, I made a very conscious choice to be a divorce lawyer, but, but my story is a lot like, and I'm not comparing myself to him, but it's a lot like Steve Jobs. Like Steve Jobs career made sense in retrospect, but like only in retrospect, like while it was going on, it was like, what is this guy doing? Like it, it didn't make sense, you know? He was into graphic design for a period of time and like typesetting. He was into, and, 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 and when it, in retrospect you go, oh yeah, like it all added up to Apple because he was interested in design and he understood fonts and he understood how important it was to have this visual element of print and, mm. and he wouldn't have known any of that if he hadn't. So my, my journey was very much like that. It was a lot a very disparate, what felt like wrong turns in my teens and 20s, early 20s, that led me that while it was going on, everyone around me was like, dude, what are you doing? Like you keep coming right up to the edge of the right thing and like you're right there and then you just walk away and go in another direction. Like, what are you doing? Are you crazy? And now, 20 something years into a career later, everybody goes, oh, yeah, dude, like you were always going to be. And you go, OK, well, at the time, I wish you would told me that because I thought I was just like, you know, just driving off the tracks, you know. Yeah. But but the truth is, like I, you know, my undergraduate degree was in psychology with a minor in substance abuse and East Asian studies. Um, I wanted to 
go into the mental health field. I worked in a community mental health center. Um, I decided to go to medical school to become a psychiatrist because I wanted to work with people and help people and deal with people who were in challenging. You went to med school and then you became a lawyer. Wow. Well, I went to med school for a week and a half and then dropped out. And everyone thought I was insane. And went, you don't get into medical school and go through all of that and drop out at the end of orientation. Yeah. Like that's crazy with well, no than, plan B. Better so than that's what I did. Three years in, you know, better than we. Well, that's what I, that's exactly how I felt, Jake. I was like, you know what? I don't want to do a year or two or three and a couple hundred thousand. Like it was right when I could get my tuition back still. And I went, <laughs> okay, I got to get out of this. And I left and I ended up going and getting a master's degree at, at New York University in essentially cultural anthropology, but, but I was studying propaganda studies, essentially mass persuasion. Mm -hmm. And I was doing my, I finished my master's. I got a teaching fellowship at NYU. So I was teaching undergraduate classes at NYU and working on my PhD. And I had the most sought after academic guideline in terms of I had a teaching fellowship. I was teaching undergraduate classes. My mentor and my, my chair of my dissertation committee was going to be Neil Postman, who was a prolific writer and brilliant thinker. Um, and it was, you know, I was a very sought after person to work with. And I was his research assistant on a book. And I was like, right on track to be an academic success. And I said, um, yeah, I think I'm going to leave. And everybody went, wait, what? Like, no, 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 no. You made your wrong turn already. Like right. now you are right there, man. You got, you got the position everybody wants. You're a teaching fellow. You get a PhD. You got a chair of your committee. It's a world renowned person. Like you're teaching at NYU at the age of 23. Like, no, 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 no. You don't walk away from that. I've been published in academic journals. I, I like, I was doing well. And I said, um, yeah, I just don't think the life of a professor is what I want. And I think that teaching standing in front of rooms full of students who have to just sort of listen to me is just going to mm -hmm. feed the part of my ego that you know thinks it knows everything mm -hmm. and um it's not as much like i after three or four times teaching the same class i figured out that like i would not find it exciting or challenging to just keep repeating myself Got so it. every semester you know so i went to law school and the first summer of law school, I interned at a divorce and family law firm because I thought that would be the area I'd want to go in because it was this intersection of persuasion, which being a trial lawyer, storytelling, you know, teaching, like lecturing, mm. um, but also, you know, mental health, dealing with people in crisis, dealing with really awful situations and trying to turn the Gordian knot of their problems into something manageable. And uh, the first summer, I think within the first week of the first summer, I went, this is the greatest, it's going to be the best job in the world. And that was 26 years ago, something like that. And I still very much look forward to going to work every day. Oh. I love what I do. Even, even I if love it's 17 hours. Even if it's 14, 17. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I often, it's very funny because my sons are adults now. One of them's a lawyer himself, actually. My older one's a lawyer uh, in the city. He's an assistant district attorney. So he, he wears the white hat. He gets to be a good guy. Um, puts criminals in jail. And uh, and I, I said to them at one point when they were, you know, in their late teens, early 20s, I said something about like, oh, man, I'm so tired. Like, I'm just ready for this week to be over. And they said, Dad, you love your job. And I said, you know, I love sex, but if I did it for 14 hours a day for six days in a row, I would want a break, you know. So, yeah, yeah I love it, but it can be exhausting. You know, it can, yeah, be a, yeah. it can be a grind. But, you know, when you really love what you do, um, that work just doesn't feel as heavy, you know, yeah. like, like I'm tired now. It's been a long day. I've been at it 13 hours, let's say for the day. Yeah, you've been tired. I feel like you got energy. Yeah. But when I, you know, I'm going to eat something, I'm going to go to sleep. I'll sleep well in the morning. morning. I'll get up just ready to attack it again. Amazing. You know, so. Yeah. Amazing. It's a good feeling. So that, that's awesome. That That's really cool. sounds like you found your, your calling. So earlier in the conversation, you were talking about how you became, you know, you, you grew some celebrity, online and now in New York, you know, people will recognize yep. you. But you also said that you never saw um, like fame as a goal. In other words, I think the words you said was that, you know, strangers loving you shouldn't be the goal. And yeah. it's, it's interesting you said that because I, I think a, there, there are a lot of people who I think consciously or not are, are chasing that, are chasing yeah. popularity and fame. And yeah. you know, I hate to say it, but you look at Lex Friedman who has, mm -hmm. you know, 
millions and millions and millions of viewers and followers. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he's focused on finding a life partner, if that's mm-hmm. a focus for him. And I think there's, mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you've been a, a, a opinion of this day and age, we see a lot of people, there, there are, there is a decline, I think, in, in marriage rates in some there places. Is. Are, do you there think is. people are focusing more on getting love from the social media sphere and less on with immediate relationships that should be the priority? Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think this is, this is the question of our time. You know, it really is. This is the question of our moment in history. Um, and I, I genuinely believe, I genuinely believe that technology in general offers us real solutions to imaginary problems and imaginary solutions to real problems. Hmm. I I, I really believe in my heart that the fundamental problems of life, lack of connection, not feeling loved, not feeling worthy, being lonely, being sad, um, the inevitability of illness, the inevitability of loss and death, the almost everything we do, I think, is a way to deny that, hide from it, or avoid it, right? So I, I think fame is like money. It's something that when you don't have it, you're certain that if you had it, you'd be happy. I think love is the same in some ways, like mm-hmm. it, romantic love. When you're single, you go, if I just had that someone, I'd be happy. Or when you're poor, if I just had money, I'd be happy. Or if you're not poor, you got a little money, but you'd want more money, right? Like if I was rich, I'd be. And, and, and it's a horizon that just forever recedes. Like it just forever recedes. Like the feeling that, well, if a bunch of strangers love me and tell me how great I am, the fact that my mom didn't when I was a kid won't hurt anymore. You know, or I'll finally feel worthy. Like this is a, this is a fundamental thing fallacy like it's just not true it's just not true like if you don't feel safe because of your own internal structures and history and all that money's not going to make you feel any more safe and i I represent a lot of very wealthy people who are miserable they they can't maintain a happy relationship they have substance use issues um some of them have hundreds of millions of dollars and are still working at a pace like i work at but they hate their job they don't enjoy it. And they're not actually doing, like they're in finance, many of them. So they're not even doing anything like where they could say, oh, I'm really helping this person or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're just making numbers on a page. Yeah. And, and there's a sense of like, you know, how much is going to be enough? And the same thing with fame. You know, I, I even saw a very small version of it with myself very early on. I, my book came out and I remember thinking, the day I walk into a Barnes and Nobles or a bookstore and I see my book, I'm going to feel like I made it. And I remember I walked into a Barnes and Nobles, it was on, I think on Park in the city, and I saw my book. And I went, wow, it feels really good. And I took a picture of it. And then like, you know, an hour or two later, I was like, okay, like what now? You know? And then a couple weeks later, it wasn't on the stand anymore because it wasn't new so it was just like down in the things and i would like go into the bookstores and if they didn't have my book i would kind of go like oh why don't they have my book you know or if they have it why don't they have it on the display shelf you know and then i started looking at well how are we doing on sales you know and i remember thinking well if it gets well reviewed in the new york times i'll feel good and then it did i got this amazing review to october 2018 i'll never forget a beautiful review a new york times book review and i thought now i'm gonna feel like i made it but then I was like, well, it's not a New York Times bestseller yet. It's an Amazon bestseller, but not a New York Times bestseller. So, it, And I'm telling you, it just kept going that way. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, and, and eventually I think you, I, I'm very blessed in that I figured it out early on that this was an itch that would never be scratched, that this was yeah. a horizon that would just forever recede. And so I kind of went, you know what? I'm, I'm just not going to gauge my success by how popular I am with strangers, you know? And, and that's not to say, by the way, that like, it's not a beautiful feeling when someone says, I like your work or, oh, can I, you know, I would love to have you on my show and we could talk. 
I'm, I'm so humbled by that. Like, it's a lovely, lovely thing. You, you, we, the connection, the desire for human connection, I think is why we do everything we do is right. because we want to connect, you know? But, you know, fame, I've represented some very famous people, some celebrities and their divorces, some famous athletes, and, and, and they, very few of them are happy. And the ones that are, it is not their fame or their money that has made them happy. It is something inside of them. It's a certain peace that they've made with themselves and the world and, and their own priorities. And, you know, I, I, I want to always be mindful of that. And I think we all should try to be mindful of that. And, and where does that peace and happiness come from, do you think? Or those people that have that deep sense of happiness. Yeah, it. Com- I really, I think it comes from a sense of connection. I think that 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 um, this is my own observation is that I think we are all striving for connection. I think almost everything we do is about connection. I think we're, you know, we're we are born like we are connected to our mother, you know, and then we are disconnected from her physically. And, and then we're born into the world. And we spend most of our life trying to get inside another person. I mean, you know, whatever, but it's the truth. Like we, we spend the rest of our life trying to have sexual encounters with another person that always involve being inside or pressed against another person. So if there's anything more honest than that, like that, that we just, we want to connect and we want to connect when we remember love right the love of another person it's always like the like connection whether it's the connection of conversation the connection of touch you know that the, the the moments of our life that that we remember as like the peak moments are like rarely the things that while they were happening you know you knew that that was the moment you know but but like there's a there's a scene in glen gary glen ross the play and in the film, where one of the characters is talking about lovers he's had in the past, women, and he says, you know, I don't, he says, when I think about women I slept with, I don't remember the orgasm. I remember some weird thing, like she brought me a cigarette in a cafe au lait in the morning, or the way the light hit her hair, or her hand over my head at one point. He's like, that's what you remember. And it's the truth. I, I think this is what we remember. And most of the time, it is something that brought us connection. So I think the, the common theme I've seen in happy people, personally and professionally, are people that cultivate connection with their family, with their, if they're a famous person, with their audience, but who have a very defined sense of who they are as well. So that sentiment of the crowd doesn't pull them off of who they are, you know? And, and what do you think makes a good versus bad connection like in a marriage? You know, how do you know if, uh, and can you tell speaking to a couple if, if what they have is a true authentic connection or, or not? And what, what feeds into a, a, a good connection or not? How, how much of it yeah. is, how much of it is about intent, you know, like just intentionally saying I'm, I'm committed to this person. I'm going to appreciate them. Um, yeah. That's well said. That's well said. I, th- I think, I mean, I think you just said a, a real mouthful because I think, you know, love is a verb and, and, and it's an active process, right? So you said how much of this is an, an, an intention. And I think setting that intention and then acting on that intention are two really big things. But I also think identifying who you are within yourself, you know, it's very interesting. I, I, I have a long background in martial arts and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And one of the first things we always teach people when we're self-defense aspect of Brazilian jiu-jitsu is the first thing you do is drop to base. We always say you drop to base. So you slightly bend your knees, you know, you sort of lower your center of gravity so that you're sort of, you are the firmest planted version of yourself, right? You're the most stable. So if somebody pushed you forward sideways, you're as stable as you can be so that now you can redirect that energy. You can strike, you can defend a strike because you drop to base. I think it's the same thing. I think if you have a defined sense of who you are, you're honest with yourself about your strengths, your weaknesses, your needs, where you're vulnerable, where you need work, what your blind spots might be. I think you can have very much more effective relationships because I, I, I think we all know 
in our hearts, that we can't learn everything we need to know about ourselves from ourselves. We need other people. And, and, and ideally, a romantic partner is the person who's going to, to love us, warts and all, right? See our blind spots, love us anyway, you know, and help us see our blind spots, you know, and we help them see their blind spots. But, but in a way that cultivates the best in us, you know, that I don't want to say overlooks the possibility of the fool in us, but, but clings to the firmly to the good in us, the best of us as being the realist expression of who we are, you know, and I, I think that, that if you can do that actively as a partner, that I think it makes it easier for your partner to do it for you. Got it. So being vulnerable and just being honest and ha helping them, like allowing them to critique you and to educate your, yourself, given what they're telling you about yourself. Yeah. I mean, vulner you know, vulnerable is like such a loaded word, right? Because I think a lot of men in particular in, in traditional gender roles, you know, be a man being vulnerable is like, well, you're being, because there's an element of like, you're weak if you're vulnerable. Like a, a vulnerability is a weakness, right? Of, of a sort. But, but I don't, I don't think it has to be viewed that way. That's why I like to use the term blind spots because like a blind spot is kind of something out of your control, right? You, you know, it's where you're looking at a particular moment. Whereas like vulnerability, like I, I think vulnerability for me, the way I like to parse it, particularly when I talk to other men, is, is the idea of, of um, like shoring up defenses without, like you have to acknowledge, you have to be disoriented to reorient, right? Like you have to examine the perimeter in order to shore up the perimeter. Like there's nothing, vulnerability to me is, is, is about being honest, being strong enough to be honest at what you need to work on mm. and where, where you have to shore things up. You know, we always said in martial arts that you, you, know, mm. you train your weaknesses and compete your strengths. And that's, I think, a great motto for people in relationships is train your weaknesses, compete your strengths, like bring to your partner regularly the best of you, the best of you so that they remember why they love you and they remember the greatness in you. But also, you know, train your weaknesses like like that's what I mean when I say like, you know, let your partner help you you know, see the parts that you can't see because it's behind you, you know, or it's, it's, in a, it's in a blind spot. And I think if people are strong enough and brave enough to do that, because that takes a tremendous amount of bravery, I think, to, to acknowledge where you need help. I, it took me a long time in life to learn that there was something really strong about it, acknowledging where you need the assistance of others. Yeah, yeah, like being able to say, to like vulnerability takes strength, right? It does. It does. I think there, there is nothing, there is nothing as strong as gentleness and there is nothing as gentle as real strength, like real strength. Like I've, I, you know, I, I've had the pleasure of training with, you know, some of the most skilled martial artists and, you know, a lot of them are like FBI SWAT, you know, military, uh, because Brazilian Jiu Jitsu tends to, to bring those kinds of people into it. And, um, and I tell you, the, the most lethal, dangerous guys I've ever met who could just kill you with a finger, you know, mm. are like the most chill dudes you'll ever oh. meet. Like yeah, they're so that. calm. Oh. They're so they don't need egoless. To be, yeah. Because they don't need to act like the baddest mofo in the room because they are. Like right. they know they are. And right. they don't have to put on a show of how tough they are. They know how tough yeah. they are. I, I've always you felt that. Yeah, there's like inverse relationship between how how kind of how um, bravado or machismo you act, sure. how much how you actually feel, right? And people who are self deprecating, 100%. it's like to be self deprecating, you have to be really confident. And hundred percent. And, 100%. and I, my father used to parse it. He used to say to me that empty barrels make the most noise. Mm, and wow. and I I saw it in myself as as a young lawyer when I was a young lawyer first out of law school and and I started my own firm fairly quickly and I I really it, only with the hubris of youth would I have done that I look back at it now and I'm like are you kidding me you know and uh, I thank God it all worked out but I I have to tell you like I was arrogant I was arrogant I was cocky 
I I was just sh- really showy and performative and, and arrogant is the only word for it. And I realize now, of course, it was terror. I was terrified. <laughs> like I I knew how much I didn't know. I knew how little experience I had. But I just felt like, okay, I'm going to fake it till I make it. And I'm going to be. And now when I see young lawyers doing that, and they're being with me, who's an older, more experienced lawyer, and they're doing that like postury, tough thing with, well, I guess we'll see you in court then. And I, I, I have such compassion and love for it. And I don't like humiliate them or laugh at them and be like, oh, you're being arrogant or like say like, oh, I used to be like this when I was a little pup like you. I just like kind of let them do it. And I kind of like, I just, in my own heart, I know like, oh, okay, that's, they're doing what I did when I was where they were, you know? And and I realized that if they actually knew, and if I'd known back then, that Mm -hmm. it's 50 times scarier if you're just super calm. Like when, when another lawyer says to me like, well, we're going to, you know, I'll see you in court. You know, I'm always like, okay, cool. Like you can't. You know, there's an old saying, you can't scare a prostitute with a dick. Like, you're not going to scare me with a courtroom. Like, you're not, it's not scary to me. You know, that's, that's what I do. So if someone threatens me like that and says, okay, I'm going to, you know, well, we'll see you in court. We're going to try this case then. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, cool. That's good. Like, let's make the judge earn their money this week. You know, it's good. We should try the case. It's fun to get, get in there and do it. And that person then goes, oh wait, oh no. Okay. That did not do what I thought it was going to do. You know? So I, I think there's a lot to be said for calm confidence. Do you think fear is a primary director, uh, driver for arrogance and a lot of these other? I think so. I think most of the things, and maybe this is the cynicism that comes with being a divorce lawyer. I, I think most people's primary motivators are fear and greed. But fear and greed are both, in my opinion, you know, very misplaced emotional states. You know, I, I, I think... I think fear and greed are big drivers for people. And they're also for me as a divorce lawyer, whose job is to persuade their levers. You know, I view them as levers. Like I'm going to try to push on someone's fear or push on someone's greed. Um, but I, I don't, I don't think that, I think those are both born of, you know, I think we as humans, so, so much of what hurts us is something valuable taken to the wrong degree, you know? So like gluttony, like if you look at the seven deadly sins as an example, right? Gluttony is a natural human drive, hunger taken to too far of an extreme, you know? Uh, Envy, you know, is a natural human thing. Comparison, you know, pattern recognition turned into just taken too far. You know, sloth, the desire to rest, you know, taken too far you know, become sloth, right? So each of these things, lust, you know, the desire for a romantic connection, physical, sexual connection, desire to reproduce, natural drive taken too far, it's lust. So I think a lot of these things, I think, you know, arrogance, bravado, cockiness, um, the desire to like flex on other people and put them down to make yourself feel better, gossiping, these are very natural human drives, yeah. the desire to be loved, to love, to feel good about who you are, to want people to like you, to want people to be proud of you. These are natural human drives, just taken in the wrong direction. I, I don't think, that, I, I forget who said it, but, but there's, a, there's a saying I heard once that, that, that people aren't evil because they want to be evil. They mistake it for happiness. Mm. You know, yeah. and I, I think that's very true. People mistake yeah. a lot of the things they do, they do in a misplaced attempt oh, yeah. to make themselves feel better. Yeah. I mean, everyone wants the same things, right? Everyone wants happiness, security, health, yeah. connection, think, love. Yeah. You know, what's yeah. interesting about these things like fear and greed, I think that, you know, the worst thing you can do is not listen enough to fear. Because then, you know, you get you get struck by a bullet or something bad happens to you. We have to have fear. The second worst thing you can do is react too much to fear. Right. Right? right. And then it has all these other – so it's finding the – Yeah, and fear is, is – um, you know, fear, fear is a, a natural human state. And I think it also creates the occasion for bravery. And I, I've said it before that, you know, if you're not afraid, it's not brave. 
There's nothing, there's nothing you can do that's brave that doesn't include fear. Because bravery is in the face of fear acting, like doing what needs to be done in the face of fear. If you're not afraid, you're not being brave because right. you're, it's not bravery then. Like it's not, if I, if I don't know the person is shooting when I run to rescue this person, then I'm not being brave, right? But if I know I could get shot but I'm going to run in and save this person. This is bravery then, you know, that's why like s things like firefighters, law enforcement, like I'm, I'm so humbled that the idea of like, you are running into a situation that is so terrifying. People are running out of it and you're running into it. That's bravery. And so this beautiful thing, bravery, this amazing thing can only exist because of its corollary. It can only exist because of fear. So, you know, greed, for example, when people talk about greed, they often mistake this idea of like, well, greed, you know, it's like the Michael, uh, Michael Douglas speech in uh, Wall Street where he says greed is good. You know, greed distills the human condition. It motivates. Well, no, what he really means is that, that, that desire, right? The desire, the will to power, as Nietzsche might have called it, or the, you know, the id, as, as, as Freud would have called it, the desire to just push through resistance, you know, to, to experience the feeling of one's strength by re overcoming resistance. That's an amazing natural human drive to take it to its furthest extreme. It turns into greed. And, and, and that's where it gets dangerous. Right, 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 right. That makes sense. Like you have to have the dr drive, but not so much that you're acting against, you know, your your own best interests. Right, no. and that you lose sight completely of the target. Yeah. Right? Like I, I always say that, you know, we don't know who discovered water, but it was unlikely to have been a fish because the thing in it doesn't see it. And so, so much of the day I think is best spent thinking, okay, what am I actually doing? What am I actually feeling right now? Because when I ask myself that question in, and I'm contemplative about it, even in the moment, I very often realize the answer is not what my brain initially told me it was, you know, I'm hungry. No, I'm not. I'm bored. You know, I'm hungry. No, no, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. That's all. If I drank something, I'm not going to be as hungry. You know, I'm, I'm restless. No, I, I didn't exercise today. I didn't exercise. And if I had, I wouldn't be like, oh, I'm so pissed. No, I'm not. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm cranky because I'm tired. Like, it's not, it's okay. Like, these are all, like, the more we can bravely say, yeah, I'm human. I've got this vessel, I've got this machine, and it, 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 it requires preventative maintenance, you know? And, and what is marriage? What is coupling? What is a relationship? But two entities, both struggling with that same sense of what am I? What should I do? Where should I go? What should I think? What am I actually feeling right now? And now you're trying to do it with somebody else? And you're, you're you know, it's hard enough to do it yourself. It's hard enough to, yeah. to yourself say, you know, I think I'm just tired. Or, you know, maybe I'm just worried. Like, I'm just worried about tomorrow, and that's why I feel so short-fused right now. It's hard enough to do that, and you're in your brain. So, so to do that with another person, like, that's I, – I think we should give ourselves credit for how hard that is. Because yeah. I think we, we tell people all these fairy tales – of like, you're going to meet this person and then you're just going to be so in love and you're just going to, they're going to know what you need and you're going to know what they need. And of course, when you first start dating, that's true of everybody, right? When you first start dating, someone touches your arm for a second that it's like lightning. It just feels so good. But you, that's not going to sustain. That's not how it works. So eventually you're going to have to figure out like, Hey, this person's human. I'm human. We're both trying to navigate ourselves and then each other. And those are two different pursuits. And that's why I talk a lot in my writing and, and in my work about the you, the me and the we, and that those yeah. are both all important things. Right, 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 right. Like, yeah, yeah it's about the unity. What do, am I correct in thinking that people are more afraid now of marriage than they used to be? Like if it, it, it sure. feels like maybe I'm generalizing, it feels like people are, uh, less excited about getting married or getting married later or not getting married at all. It seems to be the same with kids. People are delaying it or not having kids. Do, is that is that real? And do you know what that's about? I think so. I think so. I mean, listen, I have theories on what that's about, but it's absolutely true. Statistically, it's true without question. My personal theory from where I'm sitting yeah. 
is that I think it's 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 the pro- uh, like every like most of the problems in our society, it is a function of social media and information technology. I, I, I genuinely believe that the proliferation of information technology has dramatically changed the human condition in the present day. And 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 you know, I think it was Mencken who said, you know, we've got you know, we, we're, we're, we're prehistoric biology living in medieval institutions with godlike technology in our hands. Like that is an unbelievably dangerous combination. And I think what's happening is the people who are, we are seeing all the time. It used to be you lived in a community, you saw the people who lived in your community. You saw the people who lived next door. Maybe you could see in their window a little because they were right next door to you. But everybody else, you just saw what they showed you at Sunday at church or at synagogue or when you'd see them, you know, around town. So you didn't really know that much about everybody. Now there's an incredibly, we're all on a TV show. We're all on a show. We're all stars of a show. And we don't even know how many people are watching. We're just sending it out into the universe, right? So you're mostly seeing two kinds of people. You're seeing people who are, I don't know what balloons just there. You're, you're seeing so many, you're seeing two kinds of people a lot. And what you're seeing is you're seeing people who are performatively doing well. Okay. So you see people that are telling you how great their life is, even when that's absolutely not true. But they're hoping that if they tell you how great it is and they get the feedback that comes with that, that somehow it'll actually be that great in some fashion. Mm-hmm. So that's one type. And then the, the total opposite which is people who are just unhappy and they want you to know how unhappy they are. They are just advertising how awful their breakup was or how awful their ex is or how much women suck or how much men suck and women are canceled or men are canceled or relationships are canceled or blah, 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 blah. And so you've got two extremes, the miserable who want to advertise their misery and the blissfully happy and completely full of crap. And so, when you're in the middle of that, you couldn't possibly achieve this because it's not even real to begin with. So your own experience teaches you like, well, I don't know. I must suck because I can't like I thought I was in good shape until I saw like every guy on the Internet with eight packs and like they all look incredible. And, and if you ask them, they only eat chicken, uh, grilled chicken and broccoli. It's not, you know, Trembolone, you know, Winstrol and Anadrol at all. It's definitely just that they eat a lot of broccoli. Um, and you know, uh, over here, all the people saying like, oh, screw, why should you even matter what you learn? You know, screw what women think anyway. They're the worst. And all they want to do is take all your money and they suck and they don't appreciate you. And we're in the middle going, well, it sucks for different reasons. They're here. It sucks for different reasons here. So I'm just going to just stay like right here and just be really terrified, you know, yeah. because I don't, you know, and I, I get it. I get how, yeah. how the conundrum that creates for people. See, so, I mean, that's the argument from social media. Do you think anything has to do with selfishness? You know, people just wanting to go to the gym, focus on their career, like, oh, I'm not ready to get married or have kids. Like, I want to create some extraordinary level of security and success for myself. But that was always present. I think people always wanted those things. The, the problem is the level that is now considered acceptable is a function of what people are peacocking about. Got like, it. dude, yeah. like at a, an eight, a hundred years a years ago, eight pack with giant shoulders. So giant, but completely ripped. If that's the standard, then you're screwed. You better make working out a full time job. You are not working out a half an hour a day with that body. It's not happening. It's not happening. And say it as someone who's had an eight pack. It was like a damn full time job. Two hours a day in the gym and everything I ate was like a job, you know? So the truth is like, that's not real and and we lie and make it look like it's effortless it's effortless so yeah i just oh no i love chocolate sundays like no you don't you don't you haven't eaten a carb in six months you idiot what are you talking about or you know all i do is take this supplement no it's not you look at a liver king look at any of these people so so the reality is i think it's easy to say well i'm just working on myself what do you mean you're working on yourself what do you mean by that because i think that's a great way to hide from the the danger, like it's dangerous out there, man. You're going to get hurt. You're going to have to have some wrong relationships to figure out the right one. You're going to have to, you know, put yourself out there. Like if you want to meet a beautiful woman, you're going to have to ask out a bunch of women and be told no. 
Yeah. You want to be successful at business, you're going to have to fail a bunch of times. You have to risk and lose, you know, and, and it's easier to just go, well, I'm working on myself. I'm working on myself right now. I'm working on myself. Okay. You're working on yourself and life is just walking. It's passing you right by. It's passing you right by. So I don't know that, you know, it's, it's, um, I understand. I believe there is value to working on yourself. I'm not suggesting otherwise. I think that it begins with working on yourself, but I, I genuinely think that can become a kind of monasticism that yeah. allows people to kind of miss the boat of a lot of things because there's a lot of things you could do young and you know, they'd be easier younger, like building a family is easier when you're younger. You know, biologically, having kids if you're a woman is easier when you're younger. Socially, it's harder. You miss a lot. I was a father at 24. It sucked. Trust me. Wow. When we are 27, all my other friends were going to clubs and having fun. I had a two-year-old. Yeah. So, so, how, so how about you? Do, do people ever ask about your marriage? You give a lot of marriage advice. Is ever, does anyone ever turn turn the finger and say, James, what about you, man? How, how can you Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty open. I'm pretty open about it. I I um I talk a lot about uh, relationships. I mean, I and my own relationships even. I I think that um first of all, I I I understand that skepticism. I think anybody who who uh, like if I had a doctor who was telling me how to lose weight and he was severely he's overweight, huge. I probably wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't feel great about that. Although it doesn't mean he doesn't not, know what he's talking about. Relationships. You're helping people. Yeah. 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 You're, you're yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think I learned a lot about relationships from my divorce. I think I learned a lot about it from my failed relationships. But I also very much, you know, believe in the redeeming power of love. I, I also think, too, that what is important in different chapters of your life changes. You know, I think that when you're, you know, I'm in later middle age, you know, it, it, like I'm 51. So I don't think the focus when you're 51 is the pursuit of romantic partners and sexual conquests and things like that. Certainly in your 20s, certainly in your 30s. Like I've been a 20-something year old man. I've been a 30-something year old man. I know what it was like. I've been a teenage boy. I've raised two teenage boys. Like you're a walking gland. I get it. Everything is about, you know, romantic relationships and sex. Um, I, I think when you reach different ages, like different things become important to you. Different, different stages become important to you. But Romantic love, you know, I'm very blessed. I, I've had tremendous romantic love in my life. I've had wonderful women in my life who I can say without hesitation, I learned from, they made me a better man. I know what it feels like to love. I know what it feels like to be loved. I know what it feels like to have love and lose love. Um, and all of those were beautiful experiences. All of those were yeah. things that, that defined for me the, the most important parts of my life. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, uh, I also don't think that, you know, when someone just tells you what worked for them, yeah, I think that's like the worst advice a lot of the time. Like, like if somebody says, you know, what's a good diet? It's like, well, for who? Like for me, I know my body responds well to the following, but I know a lot of people that don't do well with that diet, you know? Like I, yeah. I, I know people that are very healthy as vegans. I was a vegan for a period of time. It did not work for me. Like it, I did not feel well most of the time. And when I switched to having some lean proteins in my diet, I felt instantly better. So that for me is a good diet. But if someone said, is that a good, is your diet a good diet? I'd say, yes, for me, it's a very good diet. For you, yep. I have no idea what that, so relationships, like I, I know what for me is important in relationships and what is success in a relationship for me, but that has to do with me and the person who I'm romantically involved with. It doesn't, the chemistry between us, that's what that has to do with. So, so to yep. say, you know, cause I could just be very lucky you know, if I've got a great romantic relationship, doesn't mean I know anything about romantic relationships. I'm just super lucky. Like there's plenty of people that inherited tens of millions of dollars. Does that mean they know anything about money? No, they're rich, but they don't know anything about money. They inherited it. Their grandfather died. That's what they accomplished, you know? So I, I think there's value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm being mindful of time also. I'm going to- Oh, yeah, yes, of course. No, no worries. No worries. Uh, soon, a couple 
questions that each of these sure. questions will probably take an hour, but we'll try to just knock them you got out. It. You so, can, I'll always be willing to come back, Jake. No worries. All right. Wonderful. So um, yeah, these are three big questions, but I'm hoping we can. Let's do it. I'll give you a quick. Uh, so you've been in relationships, you're divorced and sorry to ask a tough question, but what, what, what could you say is your biggest regret or mistake that you've made in marriage or in relationships? relationships. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I don't think I've ever been asked that, but it's a really great question and worth answering. Um, I would say at different stages in life, it was different things. So I would say my, my greatest weakness in my relationship when I was young and married, when I, when I um, married the mother of my son, so I've been divorced from for 17 years, but I, I met her in college and we dated at the end of college and married shortly after. I was incredibly impatient. Um, I was just impatient even when I would talk to her. Like she couldn't finish a sentence. I would like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like know where she was going with it and I would just sort of cut it off. And, um, and I was also, you know, terrified. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be a good provider. Um, when we had kids, you know, at a young age, I, I, I was, I, I, I didn't come from money. So I wanted to be able to provide for them. I didn't want them to struggle and I didn't want her to struggle. She was a stay at home mom. So I think that fear caused me to be an unbelievable workaholic. And I didn't realize. Fear, right? Yeah. And I didn't realize how, until I was quite a bit older and probably had a few more failed relationships that presence is so much more important than so many other things like that most romantic partners if you say to them you can have me for three days but i'm going to be pretty distracted or you can have me for two hours and you're going to have my undivided attention there's nothing else no one else in the world other than you for that two hours i i learned that most women would prefer the two hours like and i i I don't imagine maybe it's the same for men as well i know for me i would rather have you know a woman give me two three hours of her undivided attention than have her distracted or whatever so those are all things that i only learned by screwing it up by being distracted by not being present by being impatient so i i think those are those would be my biggest relationship regrets um, and, and I learned those lessons in a very hard way. And hopefully, um, I learned them to the point where I'm better at them now. I would definitely not say I solved the problem, but I'm better than I was. Yeah. Amazing. In one sentence, what's your marriage advice? Be present and stay connected. Awesome. It's a compound sentence. So, you know, I had to throw yeah. an and in there. Oh, but yeah. Be present and stay. Yeah. Be present and stay connected. I think that's the, that's the key. Yeah. That, that's great. Thanks so much for your time, man. I, I know how busy you are. So I, I'm happy to have done it, Jake. I, I enjoy your show. I enjoy uh, the minds that you have on you. You're really getting an interesting amalgam of points of view, but I can see the thread. And, and I think that that's a really, uh, a really great thing. And, and uh, I'll look forward to continuing to enjoy uh, listening to your work. And um, I'm proud to have had the opportunity to be part of it. So thanks awesome. for inviting me. Yeah, and no, I, I appreciate it. And thanks for the time, man. This, this was great. And um, have a great rest of your day and hope to talk to you awesome, soon. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot. Take care. See you soon. Bye, Bye Jake.